as part of our Henry Morton Stanley School of Christian Journalism dealing with the censored news and giving the uncensored version. Wanting to look at the French Revolution. We're heading to 14 July, which is celebrated in France for some reason as Bastille Day, which commemorates the storming of the Bastille and the launch of the French Revolution. Now, I can understand why some communist revolutionaries would want to mark this, but what's deeply disturbing is Christians, such as in Franschhoek, celebrating Bastille Day. And I don't think they know what they're celebrating or they wouldn't do it. The French Revolution was one of the most influential events of modern history. The 10-year period from 1789 to 1799, when France went from a monarchy to a republic, to a reign of terror, to a dictatorship, was one of the most tumultuous times in European history. Much myth and romantic legend has been written on what some politicians would like the French Revolution to have been. But the reality is the French Revolution was a monstrous anti-Christian horror. In the name of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, most people don't give the full title, most stop at the fraternity, but it wasn't just liberty, fraternity, equality, it was or death, or morte. Over 40,000 people lost their heads to the guillotine. 300,000 people were publicly executed by firing squads, drownings and other methods of mass murder, and ultimately many millions died in the 25 years of revolutionary war and upheavals that resulted. The French Revolution was the inspiration and continues to be the inspiration and the model for all socialist and all communist revolutions in modern history. Lord Acton, in his lectures on the French Revolution, observed the appalling thing in the French Revolution is not the tumult, but the design. Through all the fire and smoke, we perceive the evidence of calculating organization. The managers remain studiously concealed and masked, but there's no doubt about their presence from the first. It was not spontaneous. Our school textbooks were full of disinformation, I found. Yes, one of the first of the people behind them all was Voltaire. Voltaire, who said that he had destroyed the Bible and within a hundred years you'd have trouble finding a Bible anywhere but a museum. Interestingly enough, less than a hundred years after he made that stupid prediction, the Geneva Bible Society bought up his home and his printing press and began printing Bibles from his printing press in his home. Also very funny is that Voltaire, his complete leather-bound works of all of his writings were sold at an auction in 1911 for 11 cents. At the same time, the same year, one copy of the Bible, an ancient manuscript, was sold for a quarter of a million pounds. God has a sense of humor, and people who are arrogant like Voltaire, who declare war on God, lose. Then there was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was another one of these Karl Marxes of the revolution. He is the originator of the noble savage concept. He had the concept that the naked savages and cannibals in the Pacific are more noble than civilized people wearing clothes and who only marry once in monogamous marriages and who go to church. And he depicted all civilized people as hypocrites and the naked savages with free love and so on as the real ideal. And he lived up to this. He had 26 children. He didn't care for one of them. He abandoned every last one to the poorhouse. None of them lived to teenagehood all died of starvation or neglect in these poor houses and he felt nothing and he said the most appropriate thing any parent would do is abandon their children to be brought up in a poor house because family corrupts it inculcates christianity and standards and morals and monogamy and all these horrible things so he was the advocate of the noble savage and basically it was voltaire and rousseau's writings that prepared the ground for revolution. And you can actually see that the modern day Rousseau's and Voltaire's too, who want to make you feel bad and guilty about everything of your family and your heritage and your faith and your church, your people and your nation. His goal was to break all ties of blood, soil, family, race, nation, faith. Break every tie. And then you become noble when you've got no attachments, no responsibilities. You're lying drunk on the beach, eating a banana, cracking coconut and 
going from one relationship to the other with no obligations. And that is more noble than the people who work and pay taxes and bonds and care for their family and raise the next generation. But every revolution needs the revolutionary who's actually going to do the killing at the end of the day. The writers like Rousseau and Voltaire, they like Karl Marx, they lay the foundation, but they don't do the work. Robespierre is the gold standard for revolutionaries. He, once you know Robespierre, you understand everyone from Lenin, Stalin, Pol Pot, Fidel Castro, Robert Mugabe, the whole bot, and other wannabes like Julius Malema. The tools of the French Revolution were disinformation, propaganda, the subversion of language, changing the meaning of words, malice, envy, hatred, jealousy, mass murder, and foreign military adventurism as a diversion to distract the masses from the failure of government. Once revolutionaries seized control in a country, people would expect them to actually deliver on their promises of land, jobs, homes, bread, peace, whatever it is they promised. And as they can't deliver, and they're pathological liars and criminals anyway, what they then need to do is have wars to distract the people from the failure of government domestically. <coughs> now these tools have been implemented by more modern revolutionaries like Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Joseph Stalin, Mao Tse Tung, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Patrice Lumumba, Nikolai Ceausescu, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, and Robert Mugabe. The power mad and the disenchanted have continued to sing the praises of the French Revolution and to attempt to replicate its ideals. In revolutions as far afield as Russia, China, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Angola, the Congo, and Zimbabwe. Demonic forces and the Enlightenment ideals of humanist philosophers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire prepared the ground for revolution. Historian Otto Scott observed French intellectuals, middle and upper classes, had grown ashamed of their country, ashamed of their history, ashamed of their institutions. Such a phenomenon had never before arisen in any nation or race throughout the long history of mankind. A great loosening began. The country slowly came apart. For the first time since the decadent days of Rome, pornography emerged from its caves and circulated openly in a civilized country. The Catholic Church in France was intellectually gutted. The priests lost their faith along with their congregations. Strange cults appeared, sex rituals, black magic, Satanism, perversion not only became acceptable but fashionable. Homosexuals held public balls to which heterosexuals were invited and the police guarded their carriages. The air grew thick with plans to restructure and reconstruct all traditional French society and institutions. Now all this is a quote from Robespierre, Inside the French Revolution, the best book I've ever read on the French Revolution, written by Otto Scott. The heirs of the Enlightenment of the late 18th century launched the first revolution in all history against the ideas of Christianity and against Christianity's God. It was an anti-Christian revolution first and foremost. The press was spearhead, font and fuel for the revolution. The journals were mixtures of smut and politics. They admired agitators extravagantly. They never discussed the church without mention of scandal, nor the government without criticism. They relied heavily on tales of sin in high places and high-handed outrages of the court. No name, no matter how highly placed and illustrious, escaped. Through its journals and pamphlets, it could distort, color, plead, argue, lie, report, and misreport the information upon which the balance of the realm depended. As I read Robespierre, we were in the 1980s in South Africa going through this very revolution here, and I was thinking, he could have written this about the South African Revolution. Our universities and churches were doing the same kind of undermining of our country on every level. The most outrageous example of this media propaganda campaign was the malicious targeting of Queen Marie Antoinette, one of the most noble, courageous, eloquent and intelligent people to be maligned by the media. Although the princess was initially very popular, there were elder members of the court who deeply resented having an Austrian as heir to the throne and made her the target of outrageous smears, gossip and slander. France and Austria were the two great superpowers of Europe who were 
obviously competing, and this is a marriage of alliance, of convenience, but a lot of people hated Austria. Austria was the enemy, the enemy of France. Mary Antoinette was generous with her friends and with the poor alike. The princess became a major patron of the arts and sponsored soup kitchens for the poor. She innovated education for orphans. She even adopted some unfortunates. Despite all this, her enemies circulated rumours that she was extravagant, immoral, and plastered her wall with gold and diamonds. You don't need truth to slander someone. You can just cook these things up and ma imagine them. The real reason for France's increasing financial woes was not Marie Antoinette. That's what the media want you to believe. France is bankrupt because of Marie Antoinette. No, France was bankrupt because of the enormous debts incurred by France during the Seven Years' War when they lost Canada and later the expense of assisting the North American colonies in their war against France's traditional rival and enemy, Great Britain. So Britain took Canada. Now we are going to help the American colonies take away America's uh, jewel in the crown. And so it was like a revenge. But revenge is costly. Despite her enemies depicting Mary Antoinette as frivolous and heartless, she had many meaningful friendships. She is an avid reader of historical novels. She studied English. She certainly never said the quote attributed to her, if they have no bread, let them eat cake. If anyone knows anything about Mary Antoinette, this is probably the only thing the average person knows. Is, oh, isn't she the one who said, if they don't have any bread, why don't they eat cake? And I've heard this repeated over and over and over by people who should have a bit more intelligence than that. But all historians, all serious historians, dismiss that as revolutionary propaganda being attributed to the Queen. Because being an Austrian by nationality, she made a convenient target for the revolutionaries. The French involvement in the American War of Independence against Great Britain created an enormous debt for France. Yes, it succeeded in bankrolling the American War of Independence, which they called a revolution, although it wasn't really a revolution, it was a war of independence. And that made them feel very good that Britain lost this enormous amount of territory, this very valuable piece of real estate, but that was small uh, consolation when they lost the whole country as a result. This debt added to the financial crisis which started with France's involvement in the earliest ruinous Seven Year War which they actually started against Great Britain and Prussia. The colossal debt added to the financial crisis which propelled the French state into bankruptcy. King Louis XVI began his reign wisely. The depictions of Louis XVI as an empty-headed fool is not fair. His wife was certainly more intelligent than him, but he was not a fool. He dismissed the large number of corrupt and incompetent ministers he inherited from the court of his father, Louis XV. He appointed an excellent economist, Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, as Controller General. Turgot proposed a drastic solution for France's crisis, the cancellation of debt of tax privileges for the nobles, the abolition of industrial monopolies, removal of restrictions on free enterprise, and other bold practical solutions, which surely would have worked. It was the kind of economics that was needed and which America was using. However, the nobles pressured Louis XVI to dismiss Turgot, obviously reforming finances are not popular. Sort of would be um, a latter-day equivalent of Stephen Mitford Goodson. Uh, you can imagine there are a lot of people who don't want a reformer in economics. He bravely tried some short-term measures to stave off the inevitable economic collapse, which he had inherited, by the way. But when he attempted to move towards adopting to go's free market strategies, the privileged nobles and the wealthy middle class forced the king to dismiss him too. Economically, a suicidal move. But it's not like governments don't like economic suicide. The young banker Jacques Necker was then given a task of managing the completely unmanageable bankrupt economy. This was 1781. Louis entrusted one hapless man after another with a financial crisis, but all to no avail. France's international credit rating was plummeting and the country was no longer able to secure loans. When a country can't secure loans, people are looking at France saying, you might be a major military superpower, but you're not a good investment and you don't pay your debts. By mid-1788, the government had become paralyzed and no longer able to avoid admitting bankruptcy. They can't pay their bills, they can't secure loans, their debts have been called in, they're in trouble. 
the king was now forced to reinstate Necker. And he had to call for a meeting of the States General to be convened in May 1789. The Estates General consisted of three houses. It was sort of like the French equivalent of Parliament, but not quite. It didn't have the same powers. The first estate was the clergy, bishops, cardinals. Second estate were the nobles, Marquis this and Lord that and Baron that. And the third estate were the merchants and the common people. Now, although the third house had twice as many representatives as the other houses, each house was understood historically to have one vote. And in this way, they wanted a balance. Louis' government failed to specify how the three houses of the Estate General were to function, nor did he provide them with any agenda or constitution or charter. They were just constituted, and that's actually asking for trouble. There were no rules as to how they were to operate. The commoners in the Third House boldly organized themselves a self-contained national assembly, something unheard of. The nobles were outraged and convinced Louis XVI to send troops and to blockade the hall where the assembly planned to meet, prevent them from gathering there. The Third Estate then met in a nearby tennis court and vowed to continue in session until they could complete a new constitution. Now this was outright rebellion. They had no authority to do this. They were plainly rebelling against the authority of the king. Yet on 27 June 1789, Louis unwisely ordered the other two estates to join the commoners in a new combined assembly, again without providing them with any ground rules or constitution to operate by. The National Assembly spent most of its time debating the latest philosophical and political theories, most of these having their roots in Voltaire and Rousseau. The Marquis de Lafayette, who had achieved fame through his involvement in the American War of Independence, interesting enough, he was only 18 years old when he began his fighting in the American War of Independence. So at this stage, he's very young, still in his 20s. He espoused the cause of freedom and rallied the liberal ring of nobles around him. But he was inspired by the American War of Independence, and he thought that you know we could have something like the American experiment. But of course, America was mostly Protestant. France was mostly Catholic, but there were pretty nominal Catholic and getting more secular humanist in their mindset. The Count of Mirabeau dominated the assembly through his eloquent campaign for a constitutional monarchy. This is not a novel idea. Britain already had a constitutional monarchy, so he is borrowing the ideas. But again, Britain was Protestant. France was not. They didn't have the foundation for this. The most fanatical extremist ma gravitated to Maximilien Robespierre, the man on the far left. He was a strong devotee of the writings of the radical philosophers Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau wrote, It is necessary to have a cohesive force to organize and coordinate the movements of society's members. Interesting, considering he thinks the ideal is lying on the beach, uh, drunk um, after a night of orgy with people that you may not even know the names of. Uh, but he sees the need to have a mob to bully other people to do what he thinks is important. Rousseau advocated constant agitation for equality in order to maintain an atmosphere of fear where individual differences will not be tolerated. His main battle cry, do away with the family. The family is the root of all evil. Get rid of the cursed family. Because it's from the family that Christianity has been propagated from generation to generation. Christianity is really the root of all evil. Inspired by the defiance of the assembly and stirred up by revolutionary pamphlets and speeches, mobs began to roam the streets of Paris, attacking and murdering royal officials. France's financial house of cards collapsed. People could see what was going on. Capital fled the country. Economic depression resulted. Who wants to invest in a place where there's rioting and murder and chaos and where the states general are defying the very authority of the king? A series of events now combined to create food shortages and hunger. Agitators panned out across the countryside to destroy the grain stores and terrorize the inhabitants. Hired mobs staged spontaneous riots in Paris. The powers of government collapsed. Everything fell apart with astonishing coordination. In reaction, some of the nobles persuaded the king to seek to reassert his royal authority. Soldiers were ordered into the streets of Paris as a show of strength. Here you've got to understand Hegelian logic. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's like if you want to drive a nail into the wood, you bring the hammer back. 
you bring the hammer forward. The result is the nail gets driven and the moving back and the moving forward are part of the same process of driving in the nail. And so communists will agitate and create a thesis in the intention of creating a counter-reaction and that creates what they wanted in the first place. And so they provoke a reaction and the reaction plays into their hands like this. The appearance of the soldiers inspired the mobs to seize whatever weapons they could find and to storm the old fortress of the Bastille. The French Revolution is officially dated from this point, 14 July 1789. The Bastille had become a symbol of hated tyranny and much legend has grown out of this event. It was a medieval fortress way past its effectiveness. The weaponry that they had available in the late 1700s rendered this kind of fortress untenable. It was not really worth much. It just looked big and imposing, but cannon fire could reduce it very easily. This isn't exactly a very useful fort. Not like our castle in Cape Town, which was built in the 1600s, which low, thick walls. Uh, this is towering, imposing. You hammer away, bottom, the whole thing's going to fall down. It, this is not well built. As it so happens, there were no political prisoners in the Bastille at that time, but don't expect too many French history books to tell you that. Despite the fact that the Lieutenant Governor of the Bastille, M. de Launay, was guaranteed safe conduct and surrendered the fortress under a flag of white truce, guaranteed the safety of his men and the um, all of the soldiers serving him, the mob massacred his soldiers and the governor and cut off their heads and carried them on spikes throughout the streets. This is what people are celebrating on the 14th of July in Bastille Day. Just like so-called Youth Day, Soweto Day, 16 June, 1976. What are we celebrating? Stoning to death, hacking to pieces, Catholic, missionary, people working in the inner cities, cooking and eating people on the sidewalks, vicious cannibalism, brutal murders of people dedicated to helping the people of Soweto. There's nothing to celebrate, but forget the facts. Let's make a myth and legend around us, just like they did with 14 July. If they could make something 14 July sound heroic out of that treacherous, vicious savagery, then I suppose they can do it even out of 16 June. As body parts of the defenders of the Bastille were paraded through the streets, a mere seven criminal prisoners were found in the Bastille. Not one a political prisoner, but don't worry about that. When the news reached the Palace of Versailles, King Louis was astonished and he said, this is revolt. And he got the answer, no, sire, it is a revolution. The next day, King Louis arrived simply dressed with no bodyguards or tents and spoke at the National Assembly. Nobody could call Louis a coward. He was brave, even if he wasn't particularly wise on several of these occasions. He had ordered the troops to leave Paris. The people would have no reason to fear the king. Louis assured them that he had confidence in the assembly and the deputies rose to their feet, cheering with great fervour. Eighty-eight of the deputies now gathered at the Paris City Hall and took turns speaking to the enormous crowd from the balcony. And the famous 32-year-old Lafayette was elected General of the National Guard. While many seemed optimistic for the future, Mary Antoinette was filled with foreboding and burned her private papers. She was certainly the most intelligent person in the palace and she saw what was happening. Nobles now started to flee the court and the country and many settled across the border. On the 17th of July, the king travelled to Paris to identify with the revolutionary mob. In October, a mob meant to be of women, but many plainly wearing beards, marched to Versailles to demand that the king transfer his residence to Paris. Why? Versailles is outside of Paris and it's the king's area, but in the middle of Paris, the mob could control the king, intimidate him. On the 6th of October, the royal family was escorted by the rioters to Paris, where they could be under the control of the revolutionaries. Otto Scott observed Paris, like the nation, was divided into the politically active and the passive. Between the many confused, disorganized and abstracted and the highly concentrated, organized and intent few, all revolutions are organized by a small minority. Two clubs came to dominate the assembly at this time. They didn't call them political parties, they were called clubs. The Cordeliers were led by George Jacques Danton and Jean Paul Marat. They were the Cordeliers. The most radical of all, the Jacobins, were skillfully manipulated by Robespierre, 
you would probably have heard time and again uh, if you read Dickens, uh, Jane Austen about the Jacobins. Uh, that's what the equivalent of when we speak about a communist or Marxist. Uh, back in the 17 and 1800s, people would speak about the Jacobins. That that means the same thing. They are the real Marxist radicals or the equivalent of that, the communists. It was in the French Revolution that the terms left wing and right wing were first coined. Those on the left were the radicals who proudly adopted the designation left as a symbol of the revolutionary defiance of Christian tradition. Because in the Bible, the Lord always refers to the saved as to his sheep on his right hand, he will say, well done, good and faithful servants, enter the joy of your Lord. To the goats on his left, he will say, depart from me, cursed into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Throughout the Bible, the right is spoken of as good and the left is spoken of as bad. Proverbs says that a fool's heart is on his left side. And so there's left is over and over referred to in a negative way in the Bible. And so these revolutionaries, because they were anti-Christian first and foremost, said we are the left. We are the goats. We are the damned. We're against Christ. And that's the origin of left. So when you have a Christian saying, I'm a Christian leftist, Christian socialist, Christian communist, it's like being a God-fearing atheist. It's just an oxymoron. On the 4th of July, 1789, the nobles and clergy renounced their privileges in the name of revolutionary equality. This is what intimidation and peer pressure can do. On the 2nd of November, the assembly voted to issue new paper money called Assignat, which sparked off rampant inflation. This is the first model for what Yugoslavia and Zimbabwe have perfected of how money can become absolutely worthless. On the 2nd of November, the Assembly voted to confiscate church property. And this was accompanied with lots of beheadings, massacres, desecration of churches, and absolute chaos. 1790 on July, the Assembly nationalized the Roman Catholic Church by enacting the civil constitution of the clergy. All clergy were employed by the state, would receive salaries from the state, and would be answerable to the state. And you can see those people who resisted. They were having the, this is a pretty classic picture of, of the uh, French Revolution. A revolutionary sitting, playing some violin while the church is up in flames, the guillotines chopping off heads, and the bishop and priest are hung uh, from the lamppost. The assembly undertook to pay the salaries of the priests from the national treasury and to create a French church under the control of the government. All revolutions aspire to this. This is what the World Council of Churches cooperates in. This is what the National Council of Churches, all these Council of Churches. For example, Mozambique, you'd have the Mozambique Council of Churches who would do everything from singing Samora Michel's praises, preaching communism, whatever is needed, but they were allowed to do baptisms and things like this. And, uh, but they effectively became commissars. And those who were unregistered churches, they were persecuted, burned, bombed, closed, imprisoned, and so on. Pope Pius VI understandably excommunicated all clergymen who took the new oath demanded by the assembly. You can't bow to the state and say, Caesar's Lord, and then say that you're serving Christ. This is why Christians were first persecuted. Christians were not persecuted in the Roman Empire because they worshipped Christ. They were persecuted because they refused to worship Caesar. Most of the clergy refused to take the oath and were evicted from their pulpits and their parishes, which also meant their homes, of course. And France was divided into 83 departments, what we would call counties, but they still use the term departments. The National Assembly now produced the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens. Now, what strikes you when you look at this Declaration of the Rights of Man? Notice it's unmistakably in the shape of the Ten Commandments tablets given on Mount Sinai to Moses. And so what they're doing is they're effectively declaring a new religion, a new law, a new foundation of society. This, this on its own just shows how blasphemous it was. By the way, this declaration, which I was told at school was so important, it was effectively discarded within the year. <laughs> it didn't even last a year. And they're still teaching us in schools how absolutely important this was. Although it was patterned after the English Bill of Rights of 1689, which was a good Christian Bill of Rights, and the American Bill of Rights, which was somewhat Christian, 
which had been appended to the United States Constitution, the French Declaration embodied mostly humanistic ideals of the Enlightenment. While attempting to adopt many of the forms of the biblically orientated Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, which some were inspired, that's a good model because England's got more freedom and uh, they've got a constitutional monarchy and we should do something like that. And so some people are caught up with the forms. This looks promising. But the French Declaration of the Rights of Man failed to recognize the Creator and ignored the biblical foundations for true freedom. So the form might have looked promising. Maybe it's something like Magna Carta or the English Bill of Rights, but it actually was nothing like it. And you could see toppling the old order, pulling down of their historic monuments. The new constitution was completed in 1791 with a unicameral legislator elected by active citizens. What's an active citizen? A loyal revolutionary, basically. Just like the way the communists refer to the party and the people are one. And so the people shall govern means the party shall govern and only those party members that we say are good loyal party members, which basically means it's a very arbitrary definition of who's a citizen or not. Before Mirabu died, in April 1791, he predicted that all the well-deliberated efforts at reform would collapse and be washed away in a bloodbath. And he could not have known how true that was. He must have underestimated what was coming. But he helped bring it about. Louis XVI now attempted to flee with his family from France on the night of 20 June 1791, a good two years too late. When radicals discovered them, they blocked their path and escort the royal family back to Paris. In fact, the evidence is that they were waiting for them to do it, and they goaded them to do it, and they wanted them to do something to be able to say that they had effectively resigned. And so they made such a scene of it, it's almost inevitable that they wanted and provoked and goaded this, waiting for the royal family to try and flee, because they could see, look, we are going to kill them, and they wanted them to know this, and once they fled, then they could stop them and pull them back and disgrace them and, and have a trial. Danton and Robespierre seized upon this event as an opportunity to proclaim that France is now a republic. The monarchy is abolished. As the new legislative assembly met 1st October 1791, the Gurgondists proposed replacing the just adopted constitution and making a republic. So the first constitution was a constitutional monarchy, and there's big fanfare about that, and they still make a big thing about this thing. But they discard it within a couple of months of producing it. Deeply concerned for the fate of the royal family, Austria, ruled by Leopold II, the brother of Marie Antoinette, prepared to invade France. I mean, at this point, he's rightly concerned his sister's life is in danger. The Assembly of France therefore declared war on Austria 1792. And the French were soon defeated by the Austrians and the Prussians. And you can see how you started to have some real chaotic shambles. There was civil war at parts of France that were in civil war around Nantes and around Avion and Marseille and uh, um, massive amounts of territory lost and real chaos, as well as invading uh, the Netherlands, which of course led to Britain taking the Cape because the Cape was under the Netherlands and when the Netherlands fell to the French. So even our history here in the Cape were affected by the revolution in France. And I might add that as the revolution in France occurred, we started to have revolutions in South Africa. Swellendam declared itself an independent republic and there were other attempts to. Well, the mob stormed the king's residence and massacred the Royal Swiss Guards. No French soldier stood by the king, but the Swiss Guards, who were the personal bodyguard of Mary Antoinette, they died to the man, defending the royal family. It's a disgrace on the French that no French soldiers fought to protect the king and queen, but it's an honour of the Swiss that uh, they... Uh, as done before, when the Swiss were guarding the Pope in Rome, when Rome was being sacked, they all also died to the man, not one of them surrendered. And uh, the Swiss have got a well-deserved reputation for being fearless and loyal and steadfast. The Assembly voted to depose the King and write a new constitution. I might just say, going back to this, that there was a young artillery lieutenant who witnessed this, Napoleon Bonaparte. And he looked at this and he thought, why did the king or any of his soldiers not turn the cannon on the mob? And he determined therein in this young lieutenant, Napoleon, said, if I ever face a mob, I'll give them the whiff of grape shot. In other words, like, n n like the shotgun, used not a solid sh shell, but a whole lot of small balls. And 
uh, scatter the mob because he said you cannot reason with a mob. Mobs are murderous. There's no innocent person in the mob. So Napoleon Bonaparte already filed in his mind at this point, you cannot reason with a murderous mob. And he decided, um, that's what the, that king did wrong. I will never hesitate to fire on a mob. And that's what set Napoleon's mind apart from everyone else's. On the 10th of August, 1792, the municipal government was overthrown and Danton became the self-protected, self-proclaimed national dictator. The entire male population of France was now drafted for military service. Weapons production entered high gear. September 1792, terrorist mobs swarmed through the prisons and massacred thousands of prisoners, including many nobles who had been arrested for no other reason than they were nobility, and of course their wives and daughters with them. Lots of massacres, storming, and it was chaos, but totally sanctioned by the government. Slaughtering the prisoners, wiping up people's streets, walking around with people's heads on pikes. A new national convention was called on the 21st of September 1792 to write a new constitution. In December 1792, the convention summoned the deposed king, Louis Capet, as he now was called. On 21 January 1793, King Louis XVI was beheaded on the guillotine. Not an evil man, not a repressive man, possibly weak in a crisis, he hesitated, but he was a reformer. Just like Nicholas II, the Tsar of, last Tsar of Russia, not an oppressive person. They try to make it out that way, but he, in fact, gave all the power to the Duma. In fact, he f finally resigned to the Duma. And so you can see in Louis the Sixteenth and Nicholas the Second of Russia, reformers meaning well, perhaps their main crime was that they were weak in a crisis, but they were not oppressive. Now, all of Europe was horrified. The king being executed by a revolutionary mob. Now a coalition was formed against France and it was going to be war from then on. Austria, England, Holland, Prussia, Spain, Piedmont, all prepared to restore order to France. The Jacobins now mobilized the mob to invade the convention and arrest the 31 leading Girondists. This is one interesting thing about revolutions. They do get pretty cannibalistic. They destroy their own. This launched the Reign of Terror, which officially began 2nd of June, 1793. Robespierre established the Committee of Public Safety. Now, if you've read 1984, you understand. The Ministry of Love does the torture. The Ministry of Peace organized the war. The Ministry of Plenty organized the rationing and the starvation. The Ministry of Love does the torture. Ministry of Truth does the propaganda and deals in the lies. And so, where did George Orwell get all this idea from? Well, <laughs> French Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution, they all do this. Uh, do you know what KGB stood for What the, in Russian when you translate it into English? The KGB stood for Department of Homeland Security. Innocuous names. Uh, the terrorism of the state in Cuba run by Che Guevara was the Ministry of Internal Affairs. They've got these innocuous titles. Committee of Public Safety. This is the terrorist bunch that's going to massacre tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people actually. A policy of mass public terror was unleashed with revolutionary tribunals in which all enemies of the revolution were summarily tried. Mere accusations were tantamount to verdicts of guilt and the trials were abrupt. If you've seen, for example, Tale of Two Cities, you get the idea of how these people are literally eating and jovially doing all sorts of things and then, you know, What's the verdict? Guilty. Verdict. Death in 24 hours. And it was that sort of thing. No opportunity for people to give any kind of defense and not even proper accusations. The seamstress being sent off there to the guilty and says, well, you know, what did I do? I'm just a seamstress. Uh, why am I being accused? And, you know, it doesn't matter. If the revolution demands your life, you should be happy to give it. No real opportunity granted to the accused to prepare or present any defense. Just an accusation was a death sentence. And the mob reveled in seeing the heads roll. The accused were kick, quickly convicted. They were carted off to the guillotine in these open carts for people to swear and shout and throw things at them. And the crowd would roar when they saw the heads decapitated. As they said, sneeze into the basket. They had all kinds of sick, kind of vulgar jokes. The queen, 37-year-old Mary Antoinette, was now dragged to the mockery of a trial 
16 October 1793 and guillotined the very next day. She was tried by a revolutionary tribunal and remained composed in the face of outrageous accusations and abuse. She declared a clear conscience, her Christian faith, and her love for her children, who had been taken away from her. Within a day, her hair was cut short. Why did they have to cut her hair short? It's totally the idea of stripping her of any dignity. Taking her through Paris in an open cart wearing a simple white dress, not allowed to dress in her queen's robes, anything like this. 1215, at the age of 37, she is executed at the Place of the Revolution, or Place of the Concord, as they call it today in France. She is courageous to the very last. It's disgraceful how, to this day, so many people still have a caricature of Marie Antoinette. Her son, later recognized as King Louis XVII, died as a result of inhumane treatment by his revolutionary jailers. You've got to read Robespierre to understand what that meant. Her son was taken away from her and brought up by vicious antichrist pagans who only were willing to kill him once they'd got him to curse and blaspheme. And then they were able to report back to his mother that she won't see her son in heaven because he's blasphemed and he's going to come to hell with us for all eternity. That's the mentality of these revolutionaries. They wanted to, they didn't just want to kill their bodies, they wanted their souls. They couldn't intimidate Mary Antoinette to renounce her faith, but they took pleasure in ensuring that she died after she had heard that her son had blasphemed the name of the Lord. In 1815, during the Restoration, both her body and that of Louis XVI were exhumed and received a decent Christian burial in the necropolis of the French royalty at the Basilica of St. Denis. Few women have been have had to endure such a total reversal of fortunes from being born at the very apex of power in Vienna, the most powerful family in Europe, the Habsburgs, the height of privilege, dying at the hands of a brutal mob during the French Revolution. Mary Antoinette was a victim of circumstances completely out of her own control, yet she faced her fate with Christian courage and with faith. And that's why she is the most hated person by the revolutionaries. No one was hated more than her because she is intelligent and she was Christian and she is courageous and she wouldn't back down. She wouldn't give them the satisfaction of anything. Well, this was not the end. This was just the beginning. 21 Garondas leaders, including Madame Roland, who was there chairing all the beheadings up to Lynn, were also beheaded shortly after the Queen. This is the whole thing about revolutions. Revolutions very quickly devour the most loyal followers. The Duke of Orleans, who had joined the Jacobins, who had taken name of Citizen Egalitaire, even voting for the death of his cousin, the King. He was also executed at this time. In fact, it just reminds you of an animal farm, how Boxer, the horse, the most loyal party member, the hardest worker of it all, ends up, when he's a bit too weak to do all the work, he gets shipped off the glue factory. You know, that's exactly what these communists do. They have no sense of loyalty for even their most loyal, hardworking revolutionaries. Romantic occultism taught a big bang theory of social science. If you could blow up or burn down enough buildings and kill enough people, you could produce utopia. I mean, that's reasonable. If the whole world came about as a result of explosion, then maybe if we just blow enough things up, paradise will come out of it. This is the mentality. The reign of terror spread throughout France, and when one city sought to resist, it was destroyed. The revolutionaries set up a pill outside Lyon, inscribed Lyon waged war with liberty, and Lyon is no more. They waged war with liberty? More like tyranny. Toulon was subjugated under the leadership of a young artillery officer from Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte. That's where he gained his um, notoriety. The Committee of Public Safety now launched a vicious atheistic war against Christianity. And here you can see, for example, how they would be organizing uh, divorces. If uh, somebody uh, wanted to get a divorce, they would organize that. If a person said, I'm a revolutionary and my husband or wife is a Christian, they would give a divorce and things like that on those grounds. They had the nuns lined up, nuns and priests who wouldn't... Uh, take a pledge to the revolution they were guillotined of course they invented new religion which they called the cult of reason 
At a festival at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, an actress, that's putting it nicely, she's actually a prostitute, was enthroned as the goddess of French people and France was renamed the Republic of Virtue. Robespierre called himself the voice of virtue. Ancient Rome was now lifted up as its model. They had to reject all of Christianity. I mean, they couldn't find anything in Christian history, so they went to pre-Christian history to pagan Rome. The press and the theatres were now turned to instruments for state propaganda, to ridicule and belittle anything Christian, to lift up anything revolutionary. Fashions changed to immoral, loose Roman robes. Over 2,000 churches were renamed Temples of Reason and hijacked for the promotion of this cult. Historian Arnold Toynbee wrote, In the revolution, a sinister ancient religion suddenly re-erupted with elemental or primitive violence, the fanatical worship of collective human power. The terror was only the first of the mass crimes that have been committed in this evil religion's name. On the 7th of May, Robespierre sought to impose a new religion in France, declaring a new calendar to replace the Christian calendar. 21 September 1792, the day the monarchy ended, was now declared the first day of year one of the revolutionary calendar. And they also replaced the seven-day week with a ten-day week. Robespierre abolished, appointed himself as the high priest of the supreme being in this new cult. And here they have this ridiculous, ornate, new religion. Here they've been telling everyone there is no God and religion's evil and uh, we need to be atheists. And now suddenly they're being asked to have the state religion worshipping a supreme being. Well, which supreme being is it? Well, as Otto Scott makes clear, we're talking about Lucifer. Satan. This was this is worshiping the devil as the supreme being. And so the revolutionaries show that their atheism was just a cover for Satanism and an anti Christian agenda. And it became very clear. The revolutionaries now began to turn on one another. Danton was executed the fifth of April seventeen ninety four. Now he's the revolutionary. He's the he's one of the key revolutionaries. This is Part of the inspiration of how, for example, uh, you get Snowball in the animal farm, who's the brave pig of the revolution, then he gets hounded out by the dogs, the secret police of Napoleon. Uh, and also how Trotsky, the head of the Red Army, the hero of the Bolshevik Revolution, he ends up getting the axe literally uh, from the KGB, NKVD at that stage, under orders from Stalin. So um, Danton being executed, this is just the it's a prototype. This is the prototype revolution. Everything you see in later revolutions, you see in this one. Uh, in Zimbabwe, Josiah Tongagara, the head of Zanla, the military hero in their terms, of the Zanla terrorist, he was going to be the first president of Zimbabwe. He gets assassinated just in time to let Mugabe, this political nobody who never heard a shot fired in anger and who is a complete wimp, uh, he And he is called by the Catholic priest who trained him in school, a complete coward and totally dishonest person. Never, uh, he, he said he, he knew early on that nothing good would ever come from Mugabe. This is the Catholic priest, who, Jesuit priest who was training Mugabe early on. And so the nobody, Mugabe, ends up becoming the leader. But just like Mbeki organized the assassination of uh, Chris Harney, according to uh, General Bonte Olomisa and uh, Winnie Mandela, that, that this is an inside job. So the revolutionaries start to turn one another. Then Marat was assassinated by Charlotte Corday, a Gregonda sympathizer. He was taking a medicinal bath for his debilitating skin condition and he was stabbed in his bath. Marat became an icon for the Jacobins as a revolutionary martyr. Charlotte de Corday de Amont is called the Angel of Assassination. She declared at trial, I knew that he, Marat, was perverting France. I have killed one man to save a hundred thousand. And she referred to Marat as a hoarder, a monster who is respected only in Paris. On 17 July 1793, four days after Marat was killed, Charlotte Corday was executed by the guillotine, aged 24. One of the few courageous people who dared to give the revolutionary some of their own medicine. On the 27th of July, 1794, Robespierre and 20 other of his henchmen were seized and executed by survivors of the convention. So Robespierre, the Lenin, the, this is the, the main revolutionary of the lot. He gets seized in the middle of his revolutionary tribunal, shot in the jaw uh, by one of his followers. 
This is the arrest of Robespierre in uh, the Assembly, National Assembly as they called it. Uh, here the people rebelling against him, his own people, and he was not dead. He had this bullet in his jaw. He could not talk. Um, put him on table, decide what to do with him, transported him off and put him on the same guillotine that he had killed 40,000 people on. And so you can see the wheel turns, what goes around comes around, what you sow is what you reap. More than 40,000 victims had been murdered on the guillotine under the reign of terror. 300,000 others had been murdered by firing squads or drowning. Over two-thirds of these victims had been peasants, artisans and workers. This business of, oh, well, only nobles were as though that justifies murdering people. But that's not true. Most of the victims on the guillotine had absolutely no noble position at all. We're not bourgeois in any shape or form. But the revolution doesn't care. It doesn't discriminate. And once you start killing a certain class of people, it soon gets out of hand. As Madame Roland, one of the most bloodthirsty witches of the revolution, was being ushered up to the platform to be guillotined, she faced the statue of the goddess Liberty and cried out, O oh, Liberty, Liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? Well, she should know. She had cheered and voted death to how many people beforehand? The end of the reign of terror was not the end of the French Revolution. It would be followed by the directory of three and then by the dictatorship of Napoleon, eventually culminating in Napoleon's empire, which embroiled all of Europe in ruinous war. Even after the death of Robespierre, the revolution continued to talk about liberty and equality. Not much fraternity. They continued to fight against the Christian faith. They continued to inspire more communes, more voices of virtue, more Vladimir Lenin's and Joseph Stalin's and Fidel Castro's and Mao Zedong's and Robert Mugabe's, the French Revolution was the prototype, which was followed by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, 1917, the Chinese Revolution, 1949, the Cuban Revolution, 1959, the Cambodian Revolution, 1975, which killed 40% of the total population of Cambodia in just a year or two. The Vietnamese Revolution killed millions. The Ethiopian Revolution under Mengistu. Here you can see with his buddy Fidel Castro, cigar in hand, of course. Gee, those look like thrones there. But uh, <laughs> this is the way the people's revolutions are run. The Mozambican Revolution of Samora Michel, 1975. The Angolan Revolution, 1975. Oh, what's Fidel Castro doing here too? He seems to be all over the place. In fact, he had his troops in 13 countries in Africa. Over 650,000 Cuban troops were stationed in Africa. Surrogates for the Soviets during the Cold War. There, of course, the Zimbabwean Revolution. By the way, this picture sort of reminds one of Robert Mugabe saying, never, never, never again will Zimbabwe ever be colonized again. Really? Yellow? Chinese is a compulsory language in the University of, Zim of Zimbabwe, and uh, he bulldozed down the homes of one and a half million people in 2005 because they were informal traders and they were comp competition for the Chinese. And of course, how many other revolutions have been inspired? Something like 50 odd or more and counting. In every case, these revolutionaries proved that yesterday's revolutionaries become tomorrow's tyrants and dictators. I mean, just take, for example, how oppressive Louis the Sixteenth was. I mean, Louis XVI couldn't even call his soldiers to open fire on a mob that was going to kill him and his wife. Nicholas II handed over power to the Duma, the Parliament of Russia. He had a secret police of something like uh, 150. Lenin had a secret police of hundreds of thousands. Stalin had a secret police of three million. Executions under the Tsar something in the region of 60 a year, 60-something a year, would be executed for all reasons, you know, rape, murder, things like that, assassinations. Lenin had people executed by the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands would be murdered a year, sometimes millions, and under Stalin it moved into millions a year. But the commissars liberated Russia. The Tsar was oppressive. And this is the kind of lie that is taught over and over. You get people saying how, oh, well, 
P.W. Borch was oppressive. No, he wasn't. He was a reformer. P.W. Borch was opening up things. He was, he was dismantling every apartheid law. He was a reformer. And even Nelson Mandela said to P.W. Borch, you actually are the one who should get the credit for dismantling apartheid. I mean, even Nelson Mandela had to say that to P.W. Borch. You know, you, you're the one who got rid of apartheid, not me. Which is totally true. But don't expect the average historian to admit that. And so this filthy antichrist Marxist pagan mass murdering thug is treated as a hero. And these Satanists, every one of them, as documented by Richard Von Brunner's books Marx and Satan, they are idolized even by people in our universities. And this Che Guevara burned books, banned music, hated blacks, murdered gays, and he's now the symbol for hope and freedom. I mean, how stupid can people be? This is the face of liberation in, in Mugabe, Zimbabwe. Boot on the neck while being whipped by the police. Women being beaten by the police for gathering for a prayer meeting outside a government building. And in South Africa, You've got the Southern Communist Party, the ANC, Kasatu, all working together. And yes, we've got people here who love the ham and sickle. They love the red. They love the red star, or in this case, the black star and the red flag. And they control the ANC. The ANC is nothing but a front for the Southern Communist Party. And here you can see, they claim that the EFF is the enemy, but the EFF is on the same platform with the Southern Communist Party and Kasatu in the name of the ANC. And this is another revolutionary wannabe who reads Marx and Lenin for his fun. And I bet he just wishes he could be a Robespierre. And this is what we're facing today. The EFF putting this mass murdering thug, Lenin, on their posters celebrating the great October Socialist Revolution. The 100th anniversary last year was the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. And while I don't know of anyone in the Soviet in the old Soviet Union, Russia, that celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. In South Africa, we had the EFF celebrating it. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Christian resistance is critical. In Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, he contrasts London with Paris. In London, he showed the fruit of the great evangelical awakening of George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. This is contrasted with Paris, where Renaissance humanism of Rousseau and Voltaire led to the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. Dickens' famous opening sentence summarized the drama of a tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. The contrast between Christianity and communism is dramatically presented throughout a tale of two cities. The fruit of the Protestant Reformation and the great evangelical awakening was wisdom, faith, light, hope, and joy. The fruit of the anti-God radical secular humanism and the revolutionary fanaticism which triumphed in France in 1789 produced the worst of times. An age of foolishness, unbelief, darkness, despair, and misery. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of depravity. You can write 2 Peter 2.19 over every revolution. I defy anybody to point out to me any revolution anywhere since the French Revolution that has made the world a better place. Or made that country a better place. Or that proved to be better than what they overthrew. Every revolution makes the situation immeasurably worse for everybody. It was most appropriate that in 1989, on the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain presented French President Francois Mitterrand, who, by the way, was a member of the Communist Party, a leather-bound first edition of Charles Dickens' immortal A Tale of Two Cities book. What an appropriate gift. When reporters at the G7 conference in Paris flocked to ask Margaret Thatcher's impressions of the French Revolution, the Iron Lady replied, it resulted in a lot of headless corpses and a tyrant. Prime Minister Thatcher had a sense of the momentous event 
as the G7 conference had been scheduled in Paris to coincide with the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. I mean, how idolatrously momentous is that? This was not an accident. The Iron Lady's symbolic act of resistance was itself historic. Margaret Thatcher advised the Prince, French president, read a tale of two cities, learn why the French Revolution was completely unnecessary. I mean, this is like treason and blasphemy to a French revolutionary advocate. But how bold. Nothing embodies liberty, equality and fraternity like the mass murder of tens of thousands of people, arbitrary legal rulings and aggressive wars of conquest against your neighbours. And this country, in 1989, the post office in South Africa published French Revolution 200th anniversary stamps. I wrote letters of protest all over the place, published in quite a few newspapers, and asked this government, are they insane? Why would we want to lift up the French Revolution in our country? Well, you know, what you sow is what you reap. I remember being taught in school that the French Revolution was a good thing. I was taught in school the French Revolution brought democracy to the world. What a lot of rubbish. Nothing to do with it. In fact, you get more democracy from King Alfred the Great's dooms and from Magna Carta and from the English Bill of Civil Rights, which came hundreds of years before it, not to mention the American War of Independence and the American uh, Bill of Rights. I mean, all of those produced much more freedom. And what about Switzerland 700 years ago, the oldest republic in the world? They all had freedom without mass murder. How did the French Revolution somehow predate all those things that came hundreds of years before, and how is it that they brought about freedom? They didn't bring freedom. It's a lie. Why did they teach us this even in Christian schools? I had Christian teachers teaching me these lies from the textbooks because that's what they were taught. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. I think A Tale of Two Cities is a great book to, to um, read, a great film to read. But the book I recommend more than any other is Robespierre, The Foolish Revolutionary Inside the French Revolution. This book by Otto Scott, I read it in a couple of days. It was extraordinary. In just three or four days, I, I went through a whole lot and I was intrigued because it was like I was reading what was happening in South Africa and what was still going to happen. And Charles Dickens's book, I've been through A Tale of Two Cities a few times and what a phenomenal book. But... There is one good film. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the modern versions of A Tale of Two Cities, but the 1938 version, I think it is, uh, the one uh, with Ronald Coleman, this is the best. It starts with scripture. It ends with scripture. It has a Christian heart, Christian service. You get a lot of modern remakes of A Tale of Two Cities, and like most modern remakes, they've gutted the Christian heart out of the whole novel. And so I wouldn't recommend the modern films, but um, this one we've got in our library well worth watching. It's intelligent and it's got the dialogue and it's got everything in there, the character development. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Now, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, 1991. Lenin's statue comes down. And this is the future of every revolution. Every revolution fails and every revolution ends up killing their own and every revolution ends up in disgrace. So, just to remind one, while we're in the bit, middle of the fight, this is the end of it too. The Mandela statue and Union building is going to come down as well. I mean, all they can erect all their nonsenses, but just like every statue of Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx being toppled in the old Soviet Union and the present Russia and Ukraine, you can be sure their idols here will be toppled too. So, we are going to be posting on our website and Facebook page, and on a Reformation essay, we'll have the links to the uh, videos and to the uh, audios of this presentation as we approach the Bastille Day every year, good time to remind our friends, our young reformers who are out to change the world tackles a lot of the most controversial things we've got to deal with. We've got our newsletters here that where we've tackled the nine stages of genocide in South Africa and the uh, in Christian Action magazine and newsletter and website and the Facebook page we are putting a lot of these materials on. So these are just some of the resources. A lot of good historical books available. Any questions, any comments? Um, I have a deeper question. Why did the Swiss guards um, protect um, Marie Antoinette when she was Austrian? Is there some arrangement between Switzerland and... Yes, now, those Swiss guards were Catholic, and she was Catholic. Of course you've got Swiss who Protestant, you've got Swiss who Catholic, 
and Switzerland's got a decentralized model that, that, that works. The Swiss um, Protestants, interestingly enough, don't allow mercenaries to go and fight outside the country. The Swiss Catholics do. For example, all the Pope's bodyguards are Swiss to this day. They're, the, they're all trained in the Swiss army and they are recruited and serve the Vatican. So uh, the, the Swiss are just known as not only good soldiers, but unbelievably loyal. And the fact that, that they've got an unbroken record of fighting the last man for Mary Antoinette and for the Pope at, at different times, uh, doesn't matter how bad situation, they, they won't surrender. So that's also the Swiss um, model. Um, they have said before that if any officer of yours tells you to surrender, shoot him. Because he's a traitor and he has no jurisdiction so that you will never be given the order to, to surrender. You fight to the last bullet and then you fight to the blade. You don't surrender. And so that's a major reason why no countries invaded Switzerland since Napoleon. They've become very tight. The last time they invaded was 200 years ago by Napoleon Bonaparte. And sadly, the French Swiss in Geneva opened the gates and let the revolutionaries come in and take the whole country. And uh, so they realized we can never allow this again, that we are linguistically uh, uh, divided. And so... Uh, Switzerland for the last 200 years gotten a lot tight on this. But they were pledged to defend uh, the Austrian princess, uh, the Queen of, of France at that stage, and they took their duty seriously and they would not, mm. on honour, they would not uh, surrender. They could have, but to be fair, I think seeing this mob, I think they understood, even if they surrendered, they'd have just been murdered anyway. Uh, there's you might recall during the Rwandan genocide, right at the beginning, 11 Belgian UN peacekeeping soldiers were persuaded to hand over their rifles uh, to the Interhambwe, and they all got hacked to death while alive. And so, what's the point of surrendering to a mob? You're not going to get any justice or mercy from them anyway. So, I, I think it's not just that the Swiss are known to be... Uh, Soldiers who don't surrender, I think they they probably understood the fact that with this mob, they weren't going to get away alive, even if they did surrender. Yes. Okay. When did the, the truth change? Like, when did they change the story of French Revolution? Because I remember also at school, they also gave us a different perspective of the French Revolution. So I was just wondering if Napoleon took, took over France after that. When did they change the story? Yes, so, of course, initially they started off saying we want a constitutional monarchy. Once they got a constitutional monarchy, they wanted a republic. Once they got a republic, they then wanted a dictatorship. Now, at a certain point, the dictatorship went out of control. I think when the average people saw, we were expected to worship some supreme being who actually was almost certainly Satan, and uh, some people started to say, this is ridiculous. We thought we were fighting for atheism, and now we're <laughs> busy with another religion. So the cult of reason uh, definitely helped to unravel the situation for Robespierre. Also, Robespierre had just murdered too many people, and every person's got relatives and friends and the networks. So enemies mounted, and Napoleon saw his opportunity that as Robespierre was taken down, Napoleon and two others stepped in and became the directory to re-establish order, because the people had now had six years of chaos and instability, and they were pleading for some stability. Napoleon helped give it, and as soon as he could, he established himself as the dictator and then as the emperor. As Napoleon said, I did not steal the crown from anyone. I found the crown in the gutter, and I picked it up at the tip of my sword. And Napoleon brought back uh, a lot of order. They still used some terms of revolution, but, but he changed the whole order of it. And he, for example, uh, made a concordat with Rome. He again gave the freedom to the church. He gave the churches back their property. So he undid a huge amount of the revolution. He kept some of the slogans, but <laughs> everything had changed. Uh, it, it was So you've gone from having a monarchy and constitutional monarchy to having an emperor. And... Uh, and the improvement is, well, this man wouldn't hesitate to turn the cannons on the people. In fact, that's that's what brought him to directory in, in 
1795, uh, a mob was marching on the National Assembly. He had his cannons lined up and he ordered open fire. And that changed everything. That was the end of the rule of the mob. And from this point, it was um, purely uh, bayonet, bullet, artillery, and Napoleon Bonaparte. He reasserted law and order over France. But it wasn't in the Christian tradition, although he made peace with the Pope and with the French Catholic Church. And by the way, he actually also gave religious freedom to the Protestants. Not that there were many left in France, most had fled, but still, all been killed. Uh, but uh, Napoleon did a lot of good for France. Lots of good. It was much better under him than it was under the idiots before. But it wasn't exactly freedom either. <laughs> because one of the things that Napoleon now had was, let's take as much territory as we can. And every one of his brothers ended up king of Portugal, king of Spain, king of wherever. And just Italy, he just was parceling out uh, to his relatives uh, different parts of Europe. And uh, it, he just didn't know when to stop. Uh, he ha had a peace treaty with the Tsar of Russia. He didn't have to invade Russia, but, you know, megalomaniac um, dictators don't always know when to stop. But still, Na Na Napoleon, Napoleon was not a revolutionary, but he was an opportunist. He used some of the terminology of revolution, but meanwhile, you'll see from how the uniforms changed in order of some, he reasserted a rigid order over France that no previous king of France ever had. And the funny thing is the people willing to fight and die for him. Extraordinary. Because because they had experienced chaos and they wanted order. They were willing to be under a dictator, an emperor, whatever you want to call himself, to get that order again. No more mobs running around the streets. Doesn't that prove that eventually that's what the people will after? Yes. Exactly. Revolutions don't lost. At a certain point, everyone gets sick of it. And anyway, the ones who use the revolutionaries at some point just kill them. They, they, they're too dangerous after a while. If you knew how to overthrow a government, can we trust you around while we break all of our promises? So you're going to at some stage try and overthrow us, so let's stab you in the back first. That's how these re revolutionaries say. They say there's um, no honor amongst thieves. Well, there's certainly no honor amongst revolutionaries. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I think something I picked up from Alpha's question was, was there a time at which the, the French Revolution was seen as negative and over the years has kind of become seen as positive? Or was oh. it world, sort of worldwide oh. propaganda at the time? That's well put. Yes, I, I missed that. The French Revolution was at the time regarded one of the greatest evils in the history of the world and there was general... Uniform hostility, revulsion, disgust with the French Revolution. You know, to have murdered someone like Marie Antoinette and things like this. And, uh, it, it's just, there was horror, horror, disgust. And even France, there was this revulsion. But in the 20th century, there has been, and it's mainly come from Hollywood and from the Marxists having infiltrated education, entertainment, news media and so on, that they have rehabilitated the French Revolution. Whereas before, in Britain, if you wanted to character assassinate someone, you said... You're a Jacobin. I mean, to be called a Jacobin was enough to destroy your job prospects, your anything prospects, marriage prospects, anything. Because a Jacobin meant a French revolutionary, like Robespierre's followers. So, so it's an extraordinary thing that in the last century, the French Revolution, which was uniformly hated throughout the 19th century, came to be praised and glorified and glamorized in the 20th century, which is absolutely bizarre because what that has led to is an age of revolution. Now, I haven't even gone there yet, but one of these days we will get to the follow-up of this. There was a second attempt at the French Revolution in 1830. Failed. That's in Le Miserables, um book and play. Then there was an 1848 attempt at revolution, and that was all over Europe. Remember Karl Marx, Marxist Manifesto, all that. And then you had... All those revolutions were crushed uh, because now the people knew you can't let this thing raise its head. You've got to kill it instantly. And so it all crushed and many of the 1848ers were executed everywhere from Naples to Berlin to St. Petersburg to Paris, wherever it's happened, all over the place. The survivors fled to America. 
And they, the 48ers who fled to America, because everywhere in Europe they'd be hunted down. There wasn't a place in Europe, not Switzerland, nobody would tolerate a revolutionary or 48er. They all went to America and they formed the Republican Party, which is why the Republican Party to this day has got the red tie. They were called the Red Republicans. And the first Republican president of America was Abraham Lincoln. And he and Karl Marx were friends and correspondents. And I've got several books, including on, on Marx and Lincoln, and Marx and uh, Lincoln and Lenin, and uh, Lincoln's uh, Red Republicans, and Lincoln's Marxists. And a huge amount of the key leaders of the federal forces, the Union forces of the United States, were 48ers. They were Marxist revolutionaries, and they committed the worst atrocities against the Confederate South, because to them, the South were bourgeois. The landowners were bourgeois. And so they, they saw nothing with killing prisoners, killing civilians, burning <clears throat> homes, the march through Georgia. And Lincoln never prosecuted one of his war criminals. And they were all 48ers. And he had in his cabinet a whole lot. Uh, and I, I, I'm trying to put together this whole presentation uh, on that, and I'll get to Lincoln and Lennon one of these days. The uh, extraordinary impact of the Red Republicans, the 48ers, and how they, they made such a class war in the United States, and it changed the character of America from being a Confederate state before the 1865 conclusion of the war between the states. People spoke of the United States of America are. After it became the United States of America is. It went from being a multiplicity of states to being the United States of America is instead of are. In fact, if you look at the uh, Declaration of Independence, United States is in small. America is in capital. It wasn't capital U, capital S, just, just only capital America. It was the United States of America, the 13 colonies, actually, which now were 13 states. So what Karl Marx wanted in Europe failed. And he got it moving in America. And Lincoln was the key person. This is why if you go to Cuba today, you'll see Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Boulevard, Abraham Lincoln High School. And I've asked Cubans, how can you name these places after capitalists? Lincoln wasn't a capitalist. He's a comrade. He's one of us. And to this day, you'll find the Communist Party of the United States of America, their patron saint is Lincoln. He's, he's a Marxist, really. Karl Marx love to centralization and everything else that he is going for. So uh, it, it also explains why, when you look at it, you think, but today the Republicans are conservative, and they have a red tie, and the Democrats are a bunch of liberal commies hijacked by the Communist Party USA, and they're wearing a blue tie. should be the other way around. But the Republicans once were radical, and Democrats were the conservatives. Today it's the other way around, which is why the color scheme hasn't changed. It looks a bit strange. You speak about painting the map red in America, it means Republican. But, in fact, the blue should be red and the red should be blue. So, so things don't stay the same. You've been able to press these, the switch. Oh, um, you know, I think it happened more recently. But, but I do believe, without investing in it enough, um, I think Teddy Roosevelt could have a key reason in turning the Republicans from being fairly um, uh, liberal to being more conservative. And he wasn't meant to be president. He was just vice president. And then the president got assassinated next and Teddy Roosevelt became president. And uh, when they had the chance, they got rid of him. And uh, when he tried to run again, they shot him. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was, was definitely taking the Republican Party a different direction from what they wanted. But he was a war hero and they thought he'd add to the president's chance of getting elected again because uh, he wasn't very successful. And because he had been a war hero in the Spanish-American War, they put Teddy Roosevelt on ticket, never expecting him to become president. But not all plans work out. But any other questions? It would be good to hear about the failed revolutions because sometimes it feels like these guys are just... You know, ultimately it fails, but it sometimes feels like they it almost feels like they're in control of the future. Obviously, we know they're not, but um, when you think of the synthesis and... Thesis, the, antithesis, and the synthesis, synthesis. Yeah. Uh, it's like, 
it's it's so it's so well orchestrated almost seems inevitable and i mean how, how would you stop a mob you know and, and because they're looking for that for that they, counter they, want, they, they want, want it and it's like it's, so do you do it but you can't afford not to do it it's yeah. it's really quite a thing I, I i don't know how many of you have seen it but if you might have heard of the bishu massacre 1993 uh the um, Ronnie Cashel's Southern Communist Party, horrible person. He led a mob to to try and storm uh, the capital of uh, Cisco, which was an independent state mm -hmm. under Brigadier Opagosa. And as they uh, broke through the fence and they were charging towards the capital, uh, the um, Second Brigade uh, of Cisco Infantry uh, lined out there and opened fire. And I forget how many were killed, but it was a significant amount. And you see the video of it. And as Ronnie Crystal is walking back from it, you see the biggest smile coming over his face. It's like, you've got him. This is what he wanted. He wanted to provoke a massacre. So he led his people into the fact that his people got shot up. It doesn't seem to bother him one bit. But if you do, you know, Bishu Massacre, Ronnie Crystal's, just see the video thing. There's no doubt. He comes out there and he looks like he's just beaming. It's like he's come from a victory. You provoke, 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 and somewhere along the line, someone is going to react, and that's what they want. Yes. So, so how do you deal with it? Well, Napoleon knew if you're going to deal with it, you've got to be so brutal uh, that they won't try again. Um, that's one way of dealing with it. But the trouble is, these days, most people aren't willing to go that far. They, they will hesitate, and if they do a little bit, then there'll be an uproar, and then they back off, and then they sort of fold. Uh, as happened in Nicaragua, uh, Philippines, and so there's a lot of rev you've seen the revolutions have succeeded phenomenally well in this last century, 20th century in the 19th century they failed, failed, failed failed. in fact they tried again in 1871 uh, the Paris communards, they seized Paris again there was another, so you had 1789 you had, 19, you had 1830 you had 1848, then you had 1870 to 1871, they got wiped out trouble was uh, that that was when they seized power from Louis Napoleon, uh, Napoleon the Third, Napoleon's grandchild, and uh, uh, Bismarck, uh, the Iron Chancellor of Prussia, came and just wiped them out. That was the end of the Paris Communards. So it seems that uh, dealing with revolutionaries, about the only way, is to be fairly brutal. The big success story in defeating the communist revolution in the twentieth century, um, really successful one, is Chile. The communists seized control in 1970 in Chile, and they, uh, Allende, it was every communist around the world was going to Chile. Chile was the new Cuba. This was, they were just, this was the, you know, Mandela of the time. Allende is the, the savior of Chile. And he so wrecked the place that the head of the army, Pinochet, General Pinochet, seized control. And they wiped him out. I mean, they, they, they killed those communists uh, by the thousands. And Chile, uh, in fact, uh, they would go through the streets and uh, they would uh, give men haircuts there and then. They would force women to wear dresses and not wear skimpy, immoral outfits. Uh, they took the homosexuals out to sea through blood and meat overboard, wait for the sharks, threw the homosexuals overboard, and that was the end of it. Uh, so Chile was brutal. But his death toll, when you take it all together, I think the most extravagant uh, Amnesty National ones, they might pin something from seven to 10,000 deaths, but they were military tribunals, I said at the time. Uh, they wiped out, uh, and you know, there wasn't a hippie drug dealer, prostitute, or homo wanting to be in Chile. They were all just they're gone. And Chile then became the fastest growing evangelical country in South America. It's got the highest percentage of evangelicals. Chile developed um, the highest um, economy, uh, phenomenal success. Just recently, you might have noticed when we had that earthquake in Haiti, where over 200,000 died, that was an earthquake much, 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 much lower, which in the same year, a 10 times greater earthquake occurred in Chile with something like two deaths. The difference between Haiti and, and Chile, Chile had a work ethic and a standard of building code, so that they could have a 10 times worse uh, earthquake with next to no deaths, and uh, yet uh, Haiti's port of prince was destroyed with hundreds of thousands of deaths. That's the difference between a Christian work ethic and, and a voodoo work ethic. 
if you can use a word that it would do in the same terms. So General Pinochet was hated by a lot of people, interestingly enough, uh, when uh, he was, when they tried to arrest him in, in England, Margaret Thatcher refused, and Margaret Thatcher liked him because, yeah, he's anti-communist, and we were fighting a cold war, and you wanted allies, and Chile, by the way, was a very good friend of the old South Africa, so that we used to regularly get the Chile Navy popping past here. Uh, you might have seen that, I think it's Esmeralda, the only working uh, sail ship, sail battleship, still in the world. To become an officer in the Chile Navy, you've got to sail around the world, running this, this uh, you know, climbing the rigging, sails, the, the old way, the way they would have done it back in Napoleon's day, sort of thing. And uh, they sailed around, and when the Esmeralda came into Cape Harbor, it's very impressive, it was this magnificent ship. So the, they said, Chile had a British Navy, an American Air Force, and a German Army. The Germans trained the Army, the Americans trained the Air Force, and the British trained the Navy. And the British said, if they travel around the world, they like to go to Chile the most, because the Chile Navy has their traditions, everything's up to their standards. Uh, to the British, Chile's got the best, second best Navy in the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And um, General Pinochet was Army, and uh, you look at his Army, it looks like the German Army, as in the Second World War German Army. And they were as tough as nails, and Chile just wiped out the commies. And our army would do um, exercise with them. Our navy would do exercise with their navy. Um, I don't know if our air force did anything with their air force, but but I saw Chile units up at the border in South West Africa. We'd do exchanges. We'd send our people to them, and they'd send their people to us. And I know we shared weapons, and so Chile was an ally of South Africa actually uh, back during during the war. And and General Pinochet was a dictator in the Cromwell tradition. He had a constitution, he had referendums, and when he had a referendum on um, whether they want to go back to civilian rule, the people vote for civilian rule, he resigned and handed back control to civilian rule, but by then he had wiped out the communist threat to the country. So he is a constitutional dictator with a whole lot of safeguards built in, which was quite extraordinary. Now, you won't hear too much talk about it because Chile was a completely, totally successful anti-communist <laughs> counter-revolution. So the communists would prefer you forgot about that one or demonize Pinochet. Just like a lot of people hate Oliver Cromwell to this day, but why do they hate him? I can remember when he was overthrown. What was this? He wasn't overthrown. He, he, he just died. Uh, General Pinochet handed over peacefully, lawfully. And then he died naturally. He died a natural death, but he visited Britain for medical reasons. And they wanted to arrest him, and Margaret Thatcher refused to allow that. And, uh, yes, he was, he was an awfully principled person. They tried to make about, look, he was ruthless, he obviously, but he'd seen what had happened in Cuba. He couldn't allow it to happen in Chile, and it was happening in Chile. And uh, they got rid of him. It's, it's quite a story. Anyway, um, basically, if you want to defeat communism, you've got to be decisive and you can't hold back. The people who were defeating communism, of course, historically, uh, in the 20th century, the Japanese were the most anti-communist force in Asia, and they were defeating communism in China. And so the fact that America picked a fight with Japan and provoked them all the way through till they attacked them, by turning off all the taps, oil, rubber, everything. And <coughs> we now know that they were trying to, to provoke a war with him as documents in the False Flags article in the latest Christian Action. Uh, it's been well documented that America wanted to fight with Japan. But in destroying Japan, they removed the main obstacle to communism taking over China and North Korea. Germany was the main anti-communist force in Europe. And by destroying Germany as a military force, it opened up the whole of Central Europe, we call it Eastern Europe, but actually Central Europe to communism. So it seems that the West has done more to help communism in the 20th century than actually to counter it, uh, such as the train Ian Smith's Rhodesia into the hands of Mugabe, Zimbabwe, and so on. So the West got a pretty standard track record in the 20th century, America and Britain in particular, betraying anti-communist forces, supporting, salvaging, and doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to enable communist regimes to survive. 
just consider South Africa, we had completely and utterly defeated the ANC and Swarpa. They were as defeated as any force could ever be. It was so decisive. And then the National Party did mouth-to-mouth resuscitation on the ANC and resuscitated this worthless, incompetent, useless group. Even a, We've got the books in here printed by the American CIA and military under Ronald Reagan, which analyzed all the communist groups in the world. And it basically put down the ANC as the most useless revolutionary force in the world. It had no territory, it had achieved nothing, it had never had a victory. And uh, to think that the clerk handed over the country to these worthless criminals who couldn't so much as, they couldn't defeat a platoon of SADF. They couldn't take one piece of South Africa and control it. They, they weren't like the Viet Cong or Khmer Rouge. I mean, those people could at least say they won something, fought something, conquered something, but what did they ever see of them? Hmm. Uh, it's like when you go to Zimbabwe, uh, the only national holidays they could have is for the Chamoyo massacre and the Sonoya massacre. And every time they got defeated, they've got no victories to celebrate. Hmm. We can celebrate a Battle of Blood River and Battle of Machuca, but what do they have to celebrate when they got defeated? <laughs>